Hello and welcome to this edition of the Human Rights Conversation. With me is Miro Griffiths, MBE, an entrepreneur, disability rights activist and a former advisor to the British government. Miro, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. For our first topic, Miro, let me take you back to a conversation that we had last month when we met in Strasbourg. And that was about how medical science is changing disability rights activism. You said at the time that medical science is changing activism as you know it. So tell us how. So I think the first point to recognize is how medical advancements seem to be prioritized over, I suppose, the ethical and human rights debates are associated with it. Uh, I think there's a, there's an assumption that we have complete choice over our actions, how we're informed, how we are able to rationalize all the decisions. And of course, this is not the case because for many people, the domination and the discourse surrounding uh, health and issues to do with cure and rehabilitation override any discussions around the, the possible or potential for social oppression and marginalization faced by by people and I feel that when we have discussions around uh, genetic screening euthanasia and so forth they are a reinforcement of what I see are eugenic principles and we need to be very clear on what this is because I don't want to get caught into the very personalized individual accounts of whether somebody should want to be screen want to screen out certain impairment groups or not I think we need to keep this at a macro level and consider how the idea of genetic screening and the discussions around the implications of that are part of a historical and contemporary discourse associated with eugenics and the idea of normality and the and the and the, the consequences of say, people's social position. Because there are many narratives that that almost from my point of view almost celebrate the idea of screening out certain groups such as people uh, Down syndrome, such as spina bifida, neuromuscular conditions and so forth. And this provides a very uh, effective message which says we don't want people with these conditions existing in, in, the, in the world. But the people who are driving that conversation are the medical professionals, are people with no direct experience of the politicization of disability. And they've come to the conclusion that impairment equates to, the, to, an, to, an already, uh, to a suffering and tragedy within society. But what message does that send out to disabled people? What it says is, effectively, is that your life is a fate worse than death. And when you, as I said, contextualize it, when you've got demands for uh, assisted suicide legislation, euthanasia across Europe, and almost the, the, you know, the driving force behind that, as well as at the same time, the beginning of life, you're placing these uh, opportunities to screen out certain groups. It's effectively just saying that there should be a permanent question as to whether disabled people should actually exist within society. So it isn't about choice and autonomy, which is what I hear a lot. It's, it's about a priority. And I suppose it's about ensuring that people with, with impairment conditions uh, and health conditions do not exist. And the frustration I have with many of these conversations when we talk about genetic screening is that we're having, it, we're having this debate before we've got to a position of where disabled people have choice and control and are able to be uh, supported to be part of their communities. So this has a direct consequence, I think, as to how social movements and activists will be able to articulate their messages. But then if you see the, the trajectory of where screening, genetic, genetic screening is going, then the outcome then will be that disabled people as we know it won't be represented in the social movement and in the activism because, of course, their conditions will be wiped out, so they've probably been wiped out. At, the, at, the, at that phase of the, of the embryonic pr uh, process. The arguments that you make, Miro, are, are aligned very much uh, with the Church of England. It's just produced a report entitled Valuing People with Down Syndrome, which points attention to this non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT, which is soon to be rolled out across the United Kingdom. Now, the Church of England fears that NIPT will lead to more terminations. Apparently in countries where prenatal testing is offered to women, there is almost 100% abortion rate of the fetuses with Down syndrome. So what do you make then of this ability of doctors to eradicate Down syndrome? And where, where would you draw the line then between society's morals and personal ethics? 
So I, I, I'm aware of the report, and I, and I looked at it, and I, and I suppose my reaction to it would be, on the one hand, yes, you can highlight that, but if you don't provide a counter-narrative around understanding disability as a form of social oppression and marginalization, then you're, you're setting the, the, the debate up to fail because of the overwhelming bias and narratives associated with trying to you know, uh, move forward with, with normality, trying to protect normality, trying to equate disability as, as a form of suffering. Because in that uh, article, you, 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 I think you see some of the language being used around, well, we know disability is a tragedy and so forth. But disability is not a tragedy from the individual's point of view in terms of their functioning of the body. It is, if it is a tragedy, it is only from the ideas that the individual and the family and the community has been marginalized and oppressed in terms of trying to have um, access, to, access to everyday life. But when I return back to the issue around um, activism, I think this is where we will see the consequences of the debate that you're talking about. Now, when we think about social movements and activism, we think about it in waves. And I think, and this is something that I cover in my research, which, uh, will be, which will be published later on in the year, there is a concern that by screening out certain congenital impairment groups and health conditions, you will have a very different makeup of activists and campaigners around disability because the disabled people's movement have campaigned extensively to not conceptualize disability as a medical uh, pathology issue. And there are, you know, there are, but there are accelerated advancements within the medical field to identify and eradicate these impairment groups. So you've got these two different narratives trying to grapple for space, but unfortunately the dominant view always lies with the medical professional and the medical field. And when you look at the literature, the academic literature is, is, is full of references to how genetic screening impacts on detailed people's identity. There is discussions around how, it, uh, how screening should be articulated to, to parents, to people who have uh, so-called you know, fetuses with with, with, uh, who are disabled and so forth and of course you know, there is a discussion going on around whether screening is part of this uh, is part of a, a pursuit for the for the eugenic ideals and disability studies and, and those who work with the idea of disability as a form of social oppression they continue to, to discuss the ethical implications regarding genetic screening but there is a substantial lack of literature I think pertaining to how um Screening and testing will impact the future makeup of activism and campaigners because it will shift the direction away from uh, the focus on what does disability mean in terms of uh, a rights-based issue, in terms of a political issue, and it will be left trying to um, become part of that narrative that is, that is uh, produced by uh, reproductive rights movements and health social movements, that kind of articulate disability as as a health issue which needs to be treated through health practices i.e. cure, rehabilitation and and in, in large circumstances segregation. So there, is, there are real deep concerns and I think we are not in a position to, to debate it. I think the, the disabled people's movement possibly has not necessarily highlighted it as much as an issue that it should be. And I think a lot of these conversations as we said right at the beginning is that you have the medical advancements and the political and the policy level discussions accelerating at an exponential rate that these ethical discussions and these implications for disabled people's human rights and social rights will be forgotten about or they will just only exist within the debates associated with religion, which, of course, disability and religion hasn't always enjoyed a, a positive relationship. And I think it's a mistake to leave it in those areas. We need to draw out and think about the societal implications as to what screening uh, will do and what it will and what it will and what effect it will have on people's preferences for for reproducing and bringing in the next generation of, of people to be part of society. It seems to me that this this subject essentially is one of of how much license we give scientists to make the research that they're going to make, and then in the areas that they wish to make it, and then society and individuals have to use those advances, those new techniques, and apply them on the basis of their own of societal morals, as I said in the question, or on the basis of personal ethics. Is it your argument that 
there should be a greater, uh, for want of a better phrase, a greater human rights supervision on the direction of this of this scientific research, on the direction of this these technological advances, so that the kinds of questions that or the kinds of the, the kind of debate that you wish to have takes place at the same time or before the scientists the scientists are are, are let loose. Okay, so there are a number of issues there. Firstly, this isn't just part of a wider discussion on human and social rights, because disabled people's social position, even within the even within the environments that advocate for you know issues to do with emancipation and uh, communities having better access to services and so forth, even within those areas, without a clear definition of disability as a form of oppression and marginalization, we can sometimes skew the argument very much so. So when I'm talking about how to have this debate, I'm talking really about ensuring disabled people, uh, their, their user-led organizations, and the social movements that perceive disability as a form of social oppression to be uh, at the driving seat, or in the, in, uh, 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 certainly a, a force that needs to be recognized and responded to and reacted to, uh, within these discussions. That's the first point. We need to ensure that disabled people uh, and their activists and their campaigners who, who politicise disability must be part of that. The other issues I think is that I don't necessarily know if it's about bringing this to, to, to uh, a medical class issue whereby they are just driving forward and we need to look after them. I don't see it as a kind of sinister beings of medical professionals trying to tweak this. Of course, advancements in technology and advancements in medicine and so forth are based, to a large extent, on the on the willingness or indeed the apathy of society and and the people in order to say whether if this is acceptable or not. But the problem is, is when you're talking about genetic screening and you're talking about uh, issues around how impairment fits into genetic screening and how the concept of disability fits within it, we are we are on a losing side already because the overwhelming narrative associated with the disabled people is one of tragedy, is one of pity, is one of focusing on cure and rehabilitation, is one of explaining disabled people's barriers as a result of their health condition or their neurotypical label or their mental health diagnosis and so forth, rather than thinking about how collectively we perpetuate some of these concerns or feelings about disabled people. So I don't think it's about necessarily just having the discussion with, with medical professionals. I think it's about challenging this this issue of normality. And you know there, there are some great writers on this, particularly the likes of Le Leonard Davis in America, who talks about how health implications are perceived as less than natural or the less than preferred, and that reinforces then a preferred way of being. So we have a preferred way of speaking. We have a preferred way of 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 being able to move around, uh, walking. There's a preferred way of how to process information and how to behave in certain environments. And if you fall on the outside of that, or if you are identified as being different to that to that preferred way of being, you're then perceived as something which is undesirable or perceived as something which is a threat. So I think it's not necessarily about saying to medical professionals, be conscious of the ethical debates. I think it's more about trying to enforce this narrative of disability as a political issue and ensure that those who do follow that line of thinking are involved in these discussions but making it public in the way in the way of trying to achieve everyday people's under, understanding of why they're going in this direction why they are acceptable of this process and this approach and then ask people to feel challenged by these conversations and think about okay what implications does this have for the future of how society functions. Because the policy di di direction will continue, and it will continue with genetic screening. And we will see a, a future whereby screening for very different impairment groups, the ones that even we haven't considered yet, will be on the table. And with the advancements in assisted suicide uh, legislation as well, and euthanasia, we're in a very dangerous, precarious place for disabled people in society. And I think it will only get worse until we have a debate about it and we are consider considerate of the implications as to what this issue will will um, affect in disabled people's social position now as well as in the future. How does the debate around assisted suicide 
impact on people with disabilities? So yeah, so this this again is a, is a is a real issue affecting our social movements around disabled people. As I said before, it 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 brings forward this uh, life course narrative around there are questions at the beginning in terms of uh, when you're in that prenatal ex- um, phase of, of, of development and the question is raised as to whether you should be uh, able to exist in society and whether there is a um, is there is there a preferred method of, of, of actually getting rid of you and then when you're born and, and a disabled person uh, go through their life of trying to navigate various different structures experiences of marginalization experiences of barriers has what we refer to as reduced life chances in various different areas of, of society and then at a certain point we say there is a mechanism here for you to initiate a assisted suicide i.e. whereby professionals and the state will be complicit in trying to facilitate your death it, it belongs part of this wider narrative and wider rhetoric which says as a disabled person are you valued in society because if you think about our general approach to suicide our general approach to suicide is prevention it's about trying to stop people from doing it. It's about trying to offer people support to consider the implications of what of what they're going to do and as to why they want to do it. And we try to do that in a very supportive, uh, collaborative way of trying to stop somebody from from uh, having this having this um, final decision. But for the same people, we're saying no. Okay, let's offer this on the table for you to to go through this process. And again, we can think about it in terms of you know, the individual down the road who wants this and and the problems that that person experiences and therefore uh, we, we should be providing this. Actually, the argument should be more one of more uh, macro level, which is to say what implications does this have for how society organizes itself around certain groups within the community? And if you're saying for one group we will provide prevention, but for another group we will facilitate their death, it's part of this, of this continuous narrative which says disabled people's life is a fate worse than death. And there should always be a question mark over whether disabled people should exist within society. Miro, is it your view that the arguments in favour of assisted suicide are making inroads in Europe? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, we've seen countries across Europe who have, who have assisted suicide legislation. We see countries which are debating it. We see countries which are uh, pushing back against it. But there is overwhelming support within the public for it, um, supposedly from the data which is collected. We see uh, groups who are pro suicide bringing in discussions from across uh, the globe, from other countries that have implemented the system, and yet we don't have a lot of space for the concerns and questions over what this will impact upon uh, upon uh, community development and societal uh, functioning and so forth. And again, it's quite interesting because when we started talking about genetic screening, we brought into the debate how religious groups are opposed to genetic screening. And I was saying how this, unfortunately, can can uh, sometimes compartmentalise our discussion. But it's very similar to assisted suicide as well. You see many religious groups being at the forefront of these discussions, and disabled people's groups have to either tag alongside or struggle to have that space to articulate these, these concerns and, and, and problems that emerge from assisted suicide legislation. So again, it, this is not about... Uh, which groups are opposed to it and which groups are for it and we'll just take the one which is which is most vocal or, or has most support. It's about considering the various different aspects associated with this debate and uh, be concerned about how if we don't recognise assisted suicide and genetic screening as part of a civil rights issue, then we are effectively going to go towards further uh, marginalisation, exclusion for disabled people and a overwhelming pressure to implement uh, assisted suicide, euthanasia, and genetic screening uh, opportunities. I think this uh, subject of bioethics and eugenics is something that we'll return to again in the human rights conversation. But for the moment, let's move to our second topic. The European Commission of Social Rights has published its survey of how well welfare rights are respected in Council of Europe member states. In its annual conclusions for 2017, the Commission found 175 violations of social rights in 33 countries related to health, social security and social protection. 
I asked the President of the Commission, Giuseppe Palmisano, whether governments were retreating on their social welfare commitments, and this is what he had to say. No, I wouldn't say, say so. Um, maybe it can be said that there are more problems now than uh, five, ten years ago. Uh, the situation is more difficult for social rights, this is, this is true. I, and in some cases there is also less political commitment, uh, but it, it cannot be a general conclusion drawn from our uh, examination. Now, Miro, you've been a government advisor, you've been at the heart of government. What, give, us a, uh, give us an insight into the kind of conversations that are being had amongst lawmakers and people involved in the welfare system. Is there an appetite from your vantage point for maintaining the welfare state as we see it? So my first response would be there is an appetite to not provide any prospect of radical overhaul of the welfare system, which it desperately needs. There is a, a concern around how the electorate perceive welfare and social rights, and that uh, governments are very concerned that if they are seen to reposition the debate or critique it in a way of, of understanding that actually the way things are working don't currently offer much hope or support for people who are in marginalized uh, positions and require so, uh, social security, that if they go away from that narrative, then they are weakened politically and therefore at threat of having their careers careers ended. My my view around the welfare and the social rights uh, discussion, and I'm aware of the of the of the points made by the people in in the in the videos, is that there is an overwhelming emphasis on the individual to prove why they need support, rather than recognizing that actually the inequality that they experience is a consequence of how society and by extension the state has created these levels of, of poverty, of insecurity, of inequality. So actually, social, uh, social welfare and social rights uh, and the conditions around, around social security shouldn't be focusing on trying to individualize the experience of marginalization. Rather, it should be a test and a way to understand where are the issues arising from within the community within the social structures of society that demonstrate why this is happening. And I think this is very important if you look at how the language around welfare has changed as well. So, for example, in a, in a, lot, of the, a lot of the research that has been done on this, we see how the language has changed to one of social security to one of benefits. The idea that actually you are benefiting from being given this, rather than reflecting on the reality that the, the welfare system only exists because society is, is, is unequal. The, the problem is, is that you, you have people who are experiencing systems and they are permanently trying to have their experiences individualized and personalized to the point where the individual takes responsibility for their life and for everything that they achieve rather than thinking about the collective and community and societal implications and uh, aspects which affect everybody's trajectory as they, as they maneuver uh, through social mobility or as they kind of go through those different life stages in, in society. So if you have a welfare system which individualizes people and says that you're to blame and that if you don't try hard enough, then the fault lies with you, then there is no hope for having an effective welfare system. And this is reinforced, I think, by, uh, by the media who place so much emphasis on the need to scrutinize uh, why people have support, to scrutinize uh, why people haven't uh, tried hard enough is, is the usual language that they use in terms of saying, well, you've, you've, you've failed because look at other people in your same demographics who are able to get on and, and progress through their, through their life and so forth. So the welfare system as it stands has this notion of, of conveying to the individual, you are uh, unworthy of this, you're unproductive, you have failed, you should be trying better, the responsibility is with you. And when I uh, turn on my television in, in the evening and I flick through all the channels, and most of them are reality TV shows which show objectifying images of working class communities and people who, who are trying to survive on social security. 
And again, is this level of voyeurism of t- telling the public you should be watching out for these people as to how they live their life and whether it's value for money and so forth. It's such a negative, hostile, disgusting example as to how society has progressed to the point where people who are in positions of poverty and marginalization are not even supported. They are just having questions thrown out at them as to why they're in that circumstances in the first place. All right, well, let me pick you up on some of the things that you've mentioned there. You talked at the beginning of your answer about the welfare state being in need of a radical overhaul. You said it was desperately needed. But some people would argue that the the left of the political spectrum has become a, a force for conservatism, defending the welfare state as it is, making incremental changes at the same time. But the demands for radical change have come from the right, and the fear is that this will mean that the welfare provision will be stripped out even further and that there will be a deeper and deeper cuts. So that's one point. You also talked about the state creating poverty and insecurity. What did you mean by that? So regarding your first point, the left are, uh, are somewhat to blame as well within this discussion because they haven't provided a comprehensible vision for something different and for something new with regards to uh, social security and I've been able to articulate it effectively for people to understand the potential from it. And I say that because the right and the governments which seek to contain the system as it is portray Social Security as a grit, as a gift, which is granted to people who have failed to be productive to society. As I said, it's been prescribed as a benefit to help people take responsibility for their marginalization. But the image is clear because for those for those ideologies which which are associated with this this continuous direction of of, of social security, they want to utilise private enterprise, expensive consultants, and the design and the delivery of the social security is controlled by those who benefit most from having exploited and marginalised communities. So the focus is not towards the the removal of barriers or the rights of of people who who require support. It's in order to generate profit by silencing these groups within the society that are desperately trying to survive and live their lives. So any attempt to challenge or disrupt the current assessment procedures and the review procedures are deemed as kind of disobedient, as not being reflective of the, of the current difficulties within uh, the financial uh, economic systems and so forth. But And this is why I have a problem with those who want to keep it as it is, as well, I want to protect it. I don't think the time is now is to say, that the system should be protected. Yes, we should be recognizing the harsh reality of what is happening by making these changes or by dismantling it further. But the response should be, we need to have that space to reflect, critique it, and then offer a different idea as to what social security should look like and how it should be assessed and offered to individuals. And a great example of this is how social social security in many countries for disabled people are framed around this medicalized assessment. Well, again, as, as people will know if they've listened to our other podcasts, I've talked extensively as to how you can have a government which says we're committed to understanding disability as a human rights issue, as an issue of, of social injustice, that society or it dis, um, creates the disabling barriers for disabled people. If they can say that on one side, but then have an assessment procedure which pays uh, very wealthy medical professionals to come in and assess somebody's biological limitations of their body, or the way that the, 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 fun, the how they have limited function in certain areas. How do these two issues equate? Because they can't. There's a real discrepancy between how to understand whether somebody requires support and social uh, welfare, and how we articulate the wider consequences of why this person is marginalized in the first place. These two things don't line up. And until we are able to provide a system which does line up, and says actually the whole purpose of social security is to say, we provide the support because we recognize the system, the, the system is unequal and therefore we will do what we can to, to unpack this and to uh, change the way that the society operates on the basis of access to healthcare, access to uh, education, access to employment and so forth and understand where the barriers are within those systems and structures. Then we'll be in a place to actually ensure people can have social mobility and Uh, use social welfare systems as a way of trying to navigate towards those areas if they want to do so. People might be surprised, Mira, by your claim that state 
create a poverty and insecurity. When it comes to the welfare state, and particularly if we locate it in this discussion, this general discussion about the rights of disabled people, the state intervenes to give disabled people a minimum revenue so that they can have enough to eat and pay their accommodation expenses, etc., etc. So you were critical of the state's role, but most people might be surprised at that. Well, I, I'm not surprised, and I don't think many civil activists across Europe would, would be surprised about it either. And again, I, I think this is not just localising the debate around social security, around disability, because, of course, many people re- uh, have, require access to uh, social security. But it's useful to look at how uh, the situation is with disabled people as a way of, of understanding it for other groups as well. And I say that because if I look at some of the some of the countries across Europe who, through austerity measures, have redefined the welfare system, have changed the assessment procedures for it, have changed the amount of financial contribution given to the people in these situations, you have you have a, a very interesting research and data coming out as to the prevalence of suicide and the prevalence of further marginalisation for people at the same time as having their uh, the uh, social security uh, changed or, or taken away from them. So that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is that on the basis of dis- disability, we're seeing a, an increase in institutionalization. We're seeing question marks being placed whereby local governments and the state itself will say to people, if your support is at this level, uh, you know, at, at an arbitrary figure, therefore you cost too much for us to provide you with support, and you will be placed forcibly into institutions or, 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 or uh, words to those effect. And again, there's, there's plenty of research out there by, by disabled uh, academics, by uh, researchers, by activists, who will demonstrate uh, this, this, this picture. So the reason why I say it's a responsibility to the state is because the state decides how to implement the, the, the policies and narratives associated with social security. They have responsibility to decide how the assessments should be provided, and who provides them, and also how they speak about the significance and purpose of social security. And again, coming back to disability, because as I said, disability is a very useful way of, of thinking about this debate for, um, for ac- across, the whole, uh, so- across the whole society. When I have uh, remarks being provided, when I see remarks being provided by the United Nations Commissioner on the rights of persons with disabilities, saying that certain governments are using language around social security, which is reflective of how uh, the Third Reich spoke about disabled people and the productivity of disabled people, and that there is a, there is a similarity emerging between this language directed towards disabled people as it was also perceived in areas of, of, of extreme fascism. I think there's a really startling issue that needs to be addressed here, because the state have to take responsibility for, for the social mobility, for the protection, for the living standards of the people. And for those who require social security because society is so unequal, they too must be protected by this. So the state has to acknowledge what is it doing that contributes and perpetuates this level of marginalization. And how do they want to see social security tackle this? Because currently, it's not doing anything to even address the situation at all. So what kind of social security or welfare system should we have? It should be uh, designed and developed by the people who use it or the people who are represented in those communities. It should be assessed and provided on the basis of not trying to scrutinise people's living standards or as to why they are, as to why they either perceive to want or need uh, social security. It should also be taken well away from the ideas of of individualism, as in, I will assess you individually and think about what is wrong with you as to why you can't, uh, i.e. be like everybody else who doesn't require, because that's that's the way our social security system is designed at the moment. What we want to get to is a social security system which says, this group is, is as deserving as any other group in terms of trying to have mobility, civil rights, access to the communities and so forth. We don't want to stigmatize and have a system which is embarrassing to use or should uh, or should place emphasis on the individual to say, uh, I need to justify why I'm using it. 
And I suppose the idea of, 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 the, of a social security system should also be provided on the basis of recognizing that at the same time of provi as providing support to the individual, whatever that may be, because social security doesn't just need to be about financial contributions. It should be about actually providing the availability of support in its widest sense. And there are some innovative ways of doing that. Yes, we have ideas around universal basic income, but there are some other, other, other interesting areas around actually what support should look like, how to nurture and provide support within communities, and how you have these kind of uh, transactional approaches where somebody provides support in one way and gets something back in another. So there are different ways as to what support should look like. But I would, again, reiterate this in integral issue, which is when we are addressing people's support needs and understanding what they are, we should at the same time be trying to then place emphasis and challenge as to why this is materialized in the first place. Because the more you actually invest in, in the infrastructure, in the way that societies develop, in the way that they are, that they are continuously reproduced, and how communities evolve and kind of develop in different ways and have different access to services and so forth, we need to be understanding there where is the marginalization coming from? Where are the decisions which are taking place which perpetuate or cause this level of, 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 of discrimination? And if we try to tackle those issues, then the idea of, of social security will evolve and change over time. At the moment, it's just stuck in the same narrative as it has been, and it has molded towards the ideals of capitalism and neoliberalism, as I said, around this issue of individualism, around this issue of uh, being unproductive, of being unworthy of it. And until we are in a position where we can say radical overhaul is needed, and these are the different principles which need to be embedded within a future system, we won't be able to advance very further. Do you accept the narrative around the social security system that it costs too much and we don't have sufficient funds to provide the, the kind of generous, fair system that you would advocate? And that in any case, voters won't accept higher taxes in order to fund a well-provisioned well welfare state? No, I, I don't buy the idea that it, it costs too much. Um, as I said, it, it, it's not about just giving the individual money at the end of it. At the moment, we do because we think it's a quick way of, of trying to silence the individual and uh, push the issue further down the road. What I would say is that, as I said, support should be perceived in all different ways. But the idea that there that there is not not enough money to provide the system or a possible change is a false narrative because it's just about how you redistribute and how you decide what has more more significance and more importance. The idea of, of social security and welfare is of very little importance to politicians and parliamentarians because for them it's a problematic concept to discuss and talk about because the electorate are, for the, for the majority of circumstances, in line with the ideas of, of, of capitalism and neoliberalism as a, uh, towards a social security, i.e. that it's, a, it's an excuse for people to use, it, uh, it's not justified, at, at the expense of the hard-working individual, which, of course, all these narratives are, are, are incorrect and, and, and don't do anything other than to problematize the issue further. So if we're going to try to provide a new system, it's not about saying it's a generous system. It's about saying it's a system that works and that is effective because the current system is not effective and it doesn't work and it, and it has failed vast ways of the community. And the idea of, of whether you do it through high taxation or whatever, of course, I'm not an economic, I'm not, my background's not, in, not in economic, so this would be a little bit of shaky ground if I tried to, try to do all the maths behind it, but I don't want to necessarily get bogged down in that conversation because the idea of, of, of whether we do it through high taxation or not, the idea is, that the starting point is to get the idea on the table to be discussed by communities and ensure that we get to a position where people say, actually, I see the significance and the importance of a social security system. At the moment, people don't see the importance of it. They don't see the necessity of it. For the majority of people who've never experienced it before, they scrutinize it, and they, and they, and they, and they are very critical of it, and they don't see its, its, its integral its significance and importance. And until we get to a position of recognizing what it's there for, and why should we should contribute towards it, 
as, as, as an individual who, who will say, I might use it in the future, or there might be people I know who might use it in the future, or there are other people, my, you know, my companions, uh, my fellow human citizens, who need to access it at a certain time in their life, I should be providing it for them. Because it's the same idea of, of the education system or the health service for those countries which, which pay, to, pay for it through taxation. I don't go to school anymore, but I'm happy to pay into an education system because I want children to be able to go through it and have the same opportunities as me. And it's the same line for the welfare system as well. So that discussion we were about the welfare state is a very neat segue to our last topic, which will be a discussion of the Human Rights Convention system. Now, um, Brexit is scheduled to take place in March next year, and key countries are already threatening to withdraw from the Council of Europe. The American administration has signaled that Make America Great Again could lead the country to reject some international agreements. It's clear that the post-World War II order is in a state of flux. From your point of view, is the Human Rights Convention system as we know it worth defending? And if it is, how can we encourage states to move away from this nationalist interpretation of their futures and move back towards the idea of the concert of nations? What I would start with is, yes, there is a need to protect the, the convention system because whilst there are failings within our uh, human rights legislation and system, uh, and it doesn't go far, far enough to protect people's rights and, and social status and so forth, there is a overwhelming need to consider what would happen if this was taken away. And I say that because, as we have seen through the rises of nationalism, of ultranationalism, and areas where social rights become conditional based on those objectives of the state. Uh, and I think that that, that that statement shouldn't be undermined. And it's not one that I've said. Many, many other um, activists and researchers uh, say the same, is that, Civil rights is completely civil and human rights is completely abandoned in the topics of how society should progress. Because when we talk about Brexit or the issues happening in America or across Europe and so forth, so much of our conversation is rooted within the discussions on economics, the discussion on trade, and the ideas of of people's human rights get abandoned at that very point. I spoke very recently on, on the issue of, of Brexit and the implications of Brexit for disabled people. And, and one of my points that I made from the, from the very beginning of that talk was you have had a referendum and campaign that has done very little to understand the concerns raised by communities, which are fine, and many of the issues were at the intersect between identity and class-based uh, struggles and, and, and concerns. But what we failed within that was to recognize the importance of human rights c issues to address that. There was a, there was a, there was a, dis a disregard for the, the significance of human rights conventions internationally and also within member states as to how to address some of the inequalities that people experience on an everyday life. Because the problem you've got is you have member states... And, and, and positions of power occupied by people who don't take, take care or regard or notice of human rights conventions and systems at the same time as trying to tell people why they are marginalized or why they are experiencing marginalization. So it's no surprise that we have these continuous discussions around undermining or dismantling the human rights system or is the human rights convention at, at a potential end in, uh, in, in time because at the same time as having this we've got we've got real opportunities and concerns with regarding the human race existing in its entirety when you've got issues around uh, e you know ecological issues like climate change and so forth you've got the potential of nuclear war you've got uh, civil war you've got uh, regions of, of conflict across the globe and so forth, at the same time as, as all these issues are going on, we have no way of actually trying to suggest how to address these issues uh, proactively in a way to actually protect the human race going forwards. And that's why then people see 
a real um, uh, dismissal or disregard for human rights because they think, well, I've endured this level of, of marginalization for so long. You've had the convention. You've had the system in place. Why haven't you done anything about it? It's because the member states and the ruling elites and groups have, have no interest in protecting the rights of individuals if it doesn't suit their economic and political objectives. And that's why you see how human rights has moved towards uh, protecting corporations, protecting enterprises, and has done very little to ensure that, that individuals are prioritized in the debates around protecting humanity, around protecting uh, people's opportunities to move around the globe, uh, to have issues dealt with and so forth. And the problem is going to get much worse. The, the, the issues around uh, climate change will displace so many people in the future. We will have an exponential rate of, of, of a refugee crisis in the near future with regards to civil war and climate change. And yet we have no discussion as, as to how to address those issues because we are so uh, fixated on the crisis-driven agendas immediately facing us. So when those problems emerge... It's just another way then of saying, well, the human rights system has failed. Because what is the human rights system doing to, to um, shine a light on the way that we currently organize ourselves and create these levels of marginalization? Because on the one hand, you have human rights systems to say, we recognize that people need, uh, that need protection. We have these issues in place. We have the articles which say how society should be developed and how it should exist and so forth. But we also need to recognize that as policymakers, as parliamentarians, as activists, the only reason why we have a rights-based system is because society is unequal. So until we are in a position of saying, this is about protecting me, but also recognizing why this is happening in the first place, we won't get very far. And this works very well for the ultra-nationalists and those on the right, because it's a way of, of manipulating the conversation to say, look, your situation is terrible, your uh, living conditions are poor, your, the materialities of your everyday life are reduced in terms of accessing uh, essential and basic needs in order for them to be met. And look, you have civil rights, you have human rights, so forth, and this is not working for you, so you need something else, which usually then pays the way towards more uh, restrictions, uh, this idea of sovereignty and so forth. And this does nothing to actually address the issue all it does is it weakens the position of those who champion human rights because they have been unable to offer an alternative vision as to what rights should be for, as to what rights should be trying to tackle, and actually why people should be uh, supporting and protecting their civil rights. Well, on that basis then, Miro, you as a defender of, of human rights should be able to offer a critique of the arguments made by some people. They start with the notion that in the last decade or so, the system of human rights protection has been seriously damaged because it's it's seen as being a tool of social engineering, but also because of its association with politically correct identity politics, which for many people are seen as being too divisive and outdated. How do you how do you respond to that? So on the second point, I think there's the issue is is not to get lost in the in the discussion around identity politics. Rather it is to recognize that everybody should have their personal circumstances politicized. So we all have an identity and it's not about trying to dissociate identity politics from the wider uh, discussion that we're having here. What it, what it is to do is to return um, to the political and it is to return to a point where we are able to place our personal experiences and circumstances within, an, within a historical context in order to understand why we are in the position that we are. So, and I think what I think is quite interesting is we have these... these um, divergence from those who say, well, we need to look at class-based issues and those who talk about identity politics. But really, if we look at some of the social movements that, which are very uh, proactive, which, which occupy a lot of that space for debate and narratives, they are, they are at the intersect between social class issues as much as identity politics and so forth. And because what is trying to happen is we have various different groups trying to either 
offer a vision for society or say that we need a new vision for the way that society is organized. And for us, I, this is why I'm, at, I'm fascinated by the idea of, of, uh, of such concepts like futurology. Because what I want to see is not a trying to uh, protect the Human Rights Convention as it is, but it is to ask in the future, what place does human rights have? And how do we then build towards that vision? Because yes, you need to get people on board. You need to get you need people to to support your ideas. Those who talk about social class issues, I think we need to be taking uh, the conversation to that level as well, and talking as as much to them as we are to the groups who focus on identity politics, and identity issues, and try to understand how civil rights has relevance and significance to the various different uh, grievances and uh, marginalized aspects of everyday life that people experience on a daily basis. And the reason why I talk about futurology is because when we talk to young people, and I think I might have said this in one of the early podcasts, when we talk to young people, our conversation is so uh, is so um, const uh, constricted to the uh, aspects of neoliberalism and what I mean by that is the individualized nature of, of, the, of, of the human being. When we talk to young people, we talk to them about what do you want to do when, you, when you're older? What do you want to uh, grow up to do in, in your future and so forth? So we individualize the conversation at, at, right from the early point rather than actually have positions and opportunities where young people talk about what, their future, what they want the future of society to be organized. What do they want from the future of a health service? What do they want from the future of the education system and so forth? How does civil rights and human rights play a part in that? And then that's how you create a vision then for actually protecting people and having a system in place which is built fundamentally from the point of view of a rights-based approach. But we can't continue with trying to just make small tweaks and changes to the convention systems that we currently have or think about okay, what do we want to talk about in the, in the next um, policy agenda that will come out in the next year or, or the action plans and so forth? We need to be very honest to ourselves and say, what was the what is our Human Rights Convention supposed to be doing? Where is it failing? Does it reflect the aspirations of people in the communities? If it doesn't, why doesn't it do that? And how do we address that? Because politically across, across certainly over Europe and in terms of the globe as well, there is a real concern that social democracy and indeed the center is finished. And we see that in terms of areas around uh, the member states in Europe where, where, the, where, the, where the center ground has, has, all, has all but uh, vanished, where we have um, ultranationalism taking part and so forth. And the problem is, is that because the right have been so dominant in how society should be organized for, for, for a very long time, we have... The right is, is already manipulating the vision, has already got the infrastructure to offer a vision to people who are disengaged and who are marginalized and who don't realize that their marginalization comes from the, the decisions taken by the ruling class and the ruling elite. So what happens is, at the same time as the right taking opportunities to offer that vision of, uh, of change, the other sides... And the groups who are committed to to the human rights conventions and the UN charters and so forth are not able to offer any possible answer, because what people want is they are looking for an answer to the uncertainty, the unpredictableness, um, and the somewhat, I suppose, chaotic nature of the way society is organised at the moment. If the left do not provide or work towards a coherent vision of collectivism, which is rooted on an international platform. So we see the importance of international relationships, international workings that extend beyond the trade uh, negotiations and issues around economics, which has left people behind for so long. If we don't have that coherent vision of collectivism on the international platform, what is, what is, uh, which is led by the community, then what you have is the right being able to continue with their current direction until the catastrophic effects um, and the catastrophic... Like catastrophe that will be faced by everybody will become recognized by all. Because at the moment, the catastrophe out there is not seen by everybody. 
it's not recognised by everybody, but there'll become a time when we know everybody does recognise it, and by that point it'll be too late. I hear what you say, Miro, but is this really a political problem, or is it just one of boredom? The human rights system as we know it, Clearly, it was just a key weapon of statecraft in the post-World War II era, when there, there were, when there was this existential conflict between Western democracies and communism. Once the Berlin Wall came down and nations began to establish themselves as, as liberal market economies, the, the need to promote human rights and to have visible victories became less evident. So if we fast forward then another 25 years, 25 years after the end of uh, after the end of communism, there isn't the same intensity attached to the promotion of human rights for very obvious reasons. So how do you how do you push back against the boredom that has settled into the politics of Western democracies now? Just kind of what you mean by it, boredom. Well, yes, okay, so I'm I'm going to argue that there was an intensity around uh, human rights because there was this need to offer a viable alternative to communism. So you needed to speak to your black citizens. You needed to speak to your to women. You needed to speak to LGBTIQ citizens. You needed to speak to disabled people with uh, with a language that they could understand, that they could they could see themselves as part of the uh, the political structure of Western democracies. Once the once the Berlin Wall goes down, the intensity around those discussions just ebbs away, it seeps away. And then we get enmeshed in these procedural administrative debates around small, I'm going to argue, small potatoes issues compared to these big issues that were confronting us in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And so what we've got now is a boredom around human rights. You can't sell them to the public because the public say, well, look, human rights has been the platform for this flourishing identity politics, which has replaced the huge, big class questions which we had in the 50s, 60s and 70s. We now talk about what colour you are, what your internal plumbing is and who you go to bed with. These have become the main political concerns of our era instead of who exercises power on our behalf and how can we get rid of them if we think that they're doing a bad job. So those questions have disappeared and have been replaced by these issues of internal plumbing, what colour you are and who you go to bed with. And people are bored and people are angry that the these fundamental, fundamental issues that have been highlighted by the um, financial crash of 2008 have just been swept away. So my argument is, is that people are bored with human rights because they think that it's allowed us. It, it, it's become a tool of the elite that you've uh, mentioned very frequently in this today's conversation. It's become a tool of the uh, ruling elites to blind us to the real fundamental issues of society which have still to be dealt with. And that's the reason why people are bored. And that's why, the reason why politicians feel that they can say openly, well, we need to forget about human rights conventions. And states can look to leave organisations like the Council of Europe, which are devoted to the maintenance of the human rights protection system. What do you make of those arguments? And how, what would you cite in defence of the human rights system as we've as, as you've articulated, not in this kind of uh, academic, it's, it's important because it's important type, type analysis, but the kind of meat and drink, what will, what will reach into the psyche of the voter to, to let him or her know that human rights still need to be defended and still need to be fought for and the victories are not permanent? So this is why I, 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 I'm concerned that the current trajectory of human rights has been one to protect corporations, uh, the banking sector, and so forth, in order to, at the expense of, of the everyday person, um, and therefore the narrative then becomes one of social rights and human rights are a gift that is granted to the individual um, or granted to the community, and once you've got it, therefore you you must always have it, and there's a complacency that um, that the state would never take that away from it, or the state would never do any harm to the individual for its own benefits. And this is why I think you, you, you see very effectively how uh, issues like Brexit, for example, carry on, and, and issues around bills of rights, member state bills of rights as opposed to European conventions, or why there is an issue 
um, uh, regarding the uh, um, European Court of, 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 of Justice and so forth, is that people think that human rights are conditional and therefore are serving, um, are, 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 there to, are there to provide support to individuals, whereas actually they are just serving uh, those who have, who have considerable power. I suppose in order to try to tackle some of these feelings of the gift model or the idea of, of, of why, so, uh, why social rights are important for people, is that we need to get to a point of trying to unpack or uh, critique or focus on this idea of exceptionalism within member states. Because so often you have exceptionalism being espoused in order to gain and secure popularity. Um, and when you have that, you will then have a human rights convention which will sadly be of little significance going forwards. And as I said, because if you have political parties and electoral systems which focus on corporations, on the private sector, on wealthy backers and so forth, well, their interests are not in the human rights system. Their interest is just, is just in silencing people. And that's why you have a culture industry which is there to placate people's uh, Interest, which I think is now being pushed back, as you've seen, you know, uh, on the left, you've seen a, a groundswell of support across Europe in various different areas. Similarly, you've also seen the right, and this is why I think the centre ground is, is is pretty much finished. But the problem is, is that those who who want to manip manipulate human rights, they argue for human rights to be used in a way of protecting people, but actually, it's just to fulfil the aspirations and the needs of the elites. So, in turn. This means that, that, that you know, the people in, in every community are unable to reconcile their marginalization, I suppose, with, with the aspirations of a rights-based approach. How do they recognize the two together? Because on the one hand, they've got the people who are, who are deliberately causing the system to, to be unequal, to, uh, to, to cause marginalization, but at the same time, they're saying, well, we aspire to have a human rights approach. But when things go wrong, or when people are marginalized, or when we have... Um, exceptional inequality in terms of all these areas then the idea is well we have the system here and we're trying our best to make tweaks to it that's when people get fed up with it that's when people see a disregard for it and actually well it doesn't do anything to solve my issue so why should I, why should I engage with the, the human rights process I suppose that there is a real naivety amongst parliamentarians who assume that things will get better that advancements will always be made and I think this is why it get that's why I go back to a point that we've always made around that arc of progression. I think what the human rights system has done and the convention system has done is it's implied that things will always get better. Whereas actually what it said it what it, what it should have said is these are the aspirations which we want to instill within societal development, but these are constantly under threat. The problem is, is people see legislation being passed, they see Laws being made, they see a convention system which becomes uh, which which people sign up to, and then they think it's job done. But that's the only beginning part of it. So there's no there's no justification for for being com complacent within this or thinking that people are going to be looking out for you because the system is designed to not look out for you and not support the collective. And this is why I go back to my point before: is we 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 recognise that a rights based approach will will only offer tweaks to a pre-established um, set of conditions offered by the, the by the current political and economic structures. So actually, when we talk about before, when you talk about before about people aren't bothered by it anymore, well, I think people are bothered by it. But the people who are bothered by it have no opportunity to engage in the conversations that we're having. So actually, when we talk about working class communities, are we really suggesting that working class communities and people at the low end of the social and economic spectrum are happy with keeping the system as it is. I think a human rights system needs to uh, needs to consider it consider it's addressing issues of identity and class-based suppression at the same time. I think the, the, the starting point should not be to say that the current system, human rights system is redundant, but actually is is to ask have with with this convention and with our charters and so forth have we been able to problematize the issues correctly. So, do the are we so do we know or are we clear on the cascade of events that have produced the social the current social conditions 
within society? And more importantly, what do we strive for within the society? Once we are able to answer those questions and we start to understand what is the purpose of the education system, our health systems, uh, the economic objectives of, of the state, what is the point of public services, what's the point of productivity and employment and so forth, once we're able to understand those issues, then we'll be in a position to say, this is how marginalization manifests, this is how people experience oppression, and this is what we're trying to tackle. I think people have lost the sight of what, what the human rights agenda is supposed to be doing, and they've lost sight because the system as it is is so far away from that.